Oh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I know we blocked here because of the sun. Welcome to day two of uh, KCRS 23. And uh, it's our pleasure. This is almost the last minute thing because Dr. Kalin, um, you know, decided maybe to shorten his vacation a bit and uh, sleep overnight. So my greatest pleasure to present my good friend and mentor, um, Bill Kalin, to tell us a bit about NEC next direction in basic kidney cancer research and uh, why we should be all um, optimistic. Bill has been a Howard Hughes medical investigator for 25 years. You all know that his research is around understanding uh, mechanistically uh, mutation affecting tumor suppressor genes and his work has laid the foundation um, of new cancer therapies, including his work on the VHL protein helped motivate many people around the world to use VEGF inhibitor for treatment of kidney cancer. He didn't stop at that many things, including more recently, and this is just one step in the whole uh, career, um, Nobel Prize 2019 for all his work uh, about oxygen sensing um, in mammalian cell and HIF2 from the angle of HIF2 inhibitor for all of us here in renal cell cancer and launching this whole field of uh, clinical trials. So we're very, very, very pleased to have him here. Bill. Great, uh, well, thank you, Tony. <laughs> okay. uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I was asked to give a short uh, keynote talk and to me a keynote talk is not a research seminar it should be a little bit more philosophical and a little bit less your latest gel or blot so i'm going to try to keep this at 40,000 feet and make it a little bit more uh, philosophical so uh, i have the pleasure of serving on the lily board of directors and as a board member i get to see advances or lack of advances in various therapeutic uh, areas not just cancer <clears throat> and uh, so i've sort of roughly uh, schematized here what i'm observing uh, but none of this should come as a surprise. So in those therapeutic areas where we have genetically validated targets and we have reasonable biological understanding of those targets, we're making uh, lots of progress. Like for example, autoimmune disease is just kicking butt over the past decade. Uh, on the other hand, at the other extreme, psychiatry is stuck in the Eisenhower, Eisenhower era. I mean, there, there are no genetic landmarks, no biological understanding. And so really, you know, with very few exceptions, there've been no advances in psychiatry in the last 50 years, and then you have some things uh, in, in between. So the punchline here is you want targets where they're genetically validated and where you have biological understanding around the functions uh, of those targets. Uh, now, genetic validation can take many forms. Uh, it can occur as a germline a human variant or a mutation. Think of loss of function PCSK9 mutations in the human population that are associated with low cholesterol. That's about as good as it gets in terms of genetic validation. Uh, in cancer, of course, we are quite accustomed to thinking about recurrent somatic mutations. Think about activating BRAF mutations in uh, melanoma. Uh, increasingly, at least in the laboratory, we can do uh, all sorts of fancy genetic experiments, uh, knockouts, knockdowns uh, with CRISPR, RNA interference, et cetera, et cetera. But I emphasize here, let's make sure they're properly controlled experiments. Uh, and then finally, of course, we can do mouse uh, knockout studies with the caveat that at least germline knockout studies in the mouse often tell you about the role of a gene during the embryological development and may or may not speak to whether, for example, that gene is required uh, in an adult animal. Now, I talked about properly controlled. So for the young people, this is your required uh, reading. You may know that uh, uh, there's been great recognition over the past decade that many preclinical target validation studies coming largely from academic labs are not reproducible or robust when uh, retested uh, in the hands of our colleagues in, in industry. And this paper is an attempt to sort of point out some of the pitfalls and artifacts that we sometimes uh, succumb to if we're not doing the right experiments, not doing the right controls, not coming up with the right lines of corroborating uh, evidence. So again, for the young people, this is your required uh, reading. Uh, so now let's look at uh, cancer and see if this you know, rule of thumb applies. So. Uh, here, again, at the risk of oversimplification, I'm just giving you some examples of some recent approvals in cancer. Uh, and uh, no surprise, uh, at least to me, uh, most of the new drugs approved in cancer uh, 
are in that upper right quadrant, which is where you want to be. You had some form of genetic validation and you had some form of biological understanding. And so, you know, for every 10 of these, uh, there's one Velcade. Uh, I mean, there, there, people are still coming up with sort of post hoc arguments for why proteasome inhibitors were a good idea in myeloma, but let, let's be clear, that was sort of serendipity in the clinic that they were discovered to be active in myeloma, and then people again did post hoc arguments for why, of course, this was a good I idea. And there's still no genetic validation that I'm aware of that would have helped you understand that uh, proteasome inhibitors would be useful in multiple uh, myeloma. Now, uh, you might be a little surprised, of course, you, you're familiar with BRAF mutations in melanoma and ALK mutations and lung cancer, but uh, some of you might not be aware that CTLA-4 and PD-1 were amongst the first genetically valid, validated uh, immunotherapy targets. And so, for example, here are the two papers uh, that, in my mind, uh, provided genetic validation for CTLA-4. Now, in these two studies, what was shown was that if you knock out CTLA-4 in the mouse, you see increased immunity, hi hyperimmunity, autoimmunity. So, first of all, that provided genetic evidence that this was really a rheostat on the immune system, that was clear. And secondly, people, including people like Jim Allison, then made the leap, well, if you're hyperactivating the immune system, maybe this would be uh, useful in cancer. And of course, that turned out to be uh, the case. <clears throat> now, how about angiogenesis inhibitors? We're in Boston, there's been a lot of interest in angiogenesis inhibitors for the past uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, largely because of the pioneering work of uh, Judah Folkman. And you may remember, at least, I mean, at least I'm old enough to remember, I may be the only person old enough to remember when on the cover of the New York Times, it was basically declared that Folkman had done it. He had cured cancer and we were gonna cure cancer with uh, angiogenesis inhibitors such as endostatin and angiostatin, uh, even though uh, it wasn't clear how these drugs worked and there was certainly no genetic validation for endostatin and angiostatin as being regulators of uh, angiogenesis. Now, fortunately uh, later, uh, the, the, the VEGF inhibitors came along uh, and of course, with the VEGF inhibitors, we had firm genetic evidence that these were involved in angiogenesis. And, and in particular, if you made a mouse that lacked VEGF, guess what? You had fewer uh, blood vessels. And so not surprisingly, the winners here uh, in terms of the clinic were the VEGF inhibitors, whereas endostatin and angiostatin failed uh, miserably when tested uh, in the clinic. Now, I saw Dan George here yesterday, so I decided I, last night I stuck this slide <coughs> in the deck. So this is a editorial that Dan and I wrote uh, shortly after the first inkling of activity of the VEGF inhibitors in kidney cancer. And in this editorial, we compared and contrasted the path to the VEGF inhibitors versus the path to angiostatin and endostatin. Uh, and I'm told by a very reliable source who will go nameless that when Judah read this editorial, he had an emergency meeting of his laboratory and he immediately enlisted one of his most senior postdocs, a physician scientist, and said, we have to write a rebuttal to this editorial. And fortunately, the senior postdoc had the courage to say, Judah, we can't write a rebuttal. And Judah said, why? And the postdoc said, because this is indisputably correct, that if you have a genetically validated target with a known biological, a biochemical activity, it's much easier to go forward than with a target where you don't have genetic validation and you really don't know mechanistically how it works. So needless to say, that rebuttal uh, was never written. Uh, okay, so uh, now I, now let's fast forward to 2023. Uh, we have lots of genetically validated targets in cancer, including kidney cancer. Think MYC, uh, think KRAS, et cetera, et cetera. But many of these genetically validated targets, where we also, by the way, have pretty good biochemical understanding about those targets, we, but they're, they're still undruggable. Uh, they lack the right kinds of nooks and crannies to be uh, accessed with uh, small molecules and their intracellular targets, so you would need small molecules, et cetera, et cetera. But now there's a, there's a growing playbook for how you would uh, drug the undruggable, including mutations like loss of the VHL tumor suppressor gene in kidney cancer. So uh, one is, in some cases, you can go downstream of the target. And so, for example, for loss of VHL, uh, we now target uh, HIF. And thanks to the work that we and many others did, we knew that HIF2 was really the problem, and so we target HIF2. So that's really exploiting an epistatic relationship that uh, the, the cells being driven by loss of VHL on one level are being driven by excess HIF2. Uh, but HIF2 had a second problem, which again, was it wasn't believed to have the right kind of nook and cranny to be accessed with small molecules, but fortunately, uh, uh, Kevin Gardner and Rick Bruick figured out that you could potentially target HIF2 
with allosteric inhibitors, and so that ultimately gave rise to belsudafen. Uh, we also know now that in some cases you can exploit synthetic lethal interactions. Think about targeting BRCA1 mutant breast cancer with PARP inhibitors. Uh, and then finally, uh, we and others have, have shown that in some cases you can target uh, undruggable proteins with small molecule degraders. And so our group and Ben Ebert's group uh, were among the people who showed that in hindsight, the thalidomide drugs were actually molecular glues that targeted uh, two transcription factors, IKZF1 and IKZF3 for degradation by the cerebellum ubiquitin uh, ligase complex. So I think there's a lot of cause for optimism. We have more genetically validated targets and we're expanding the list of uh, druggable uh, proteins. So that's all good. But uh, in oncology, there's no shortage of uh, naysayers as we know, uh, and naysayers would point to slides like this. So uh, this is probably one of the most famous uh, pictures in all of clinical oncology. So I probably don't have to tell you uh, that this is a patient with metastatic melanoma whose melanoma had a activating BRAF mutation. They were treated with the Plexicon uh, BRAF inhibitor and had this Lazarus-like remission. But then two months later, they were right back uh, in hot water. And so this has led to a lot of hand-wringing hand in both the scientific press and the, and the lay press in terms of whether targeted therapy is really all it's cracked up to be and whether we're really going down the right road or not. And so here's a fairly influential person or at least formally influential person, Jim Watson, who wrote this uh, thought piece uh, in which he said uh, that given the seemingly almost intrinsic genetic instability of many late stage cancers, we should not be surprised when key old timers and cancer genetics doubt being able to truly cure most victims of widespread metastatic uh, disease. And the first time I saw this, I'm like, you know, way to rally the troops, Jim. Like I know if I was a 25 year old kid, I'd go into cancer because you just told me this can't be uh, done. But what Jim apparently never learned, uh, but I learned because I had the good fortune of being a fellow at the Dana-Farber in the 1980s and having uh, Tom Fry be one of my professors uh, were the principles of combination uh, chemotherapy. So in the 70s and 80s, you, you couldn't get through a medical oncology program without learning this. So the idea here is take a cubic centimeter tumor like that little tumor, those little subcutaneous nodules I just showed you. Uh, they already have 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th cells. The tumor burden in most cancer patients is more like 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 cells. So if you have a really great drug like that BRAF inhibitor, but one in a million cells are resistant, either genetically or epigenetically, uh, then your chance of cure with any one drug is essentially uh, uh, zero. Uh, but, the, but the trick is to make the math work to, for you and, and rather than against you. And so, for example, what if you could combine three drugs that have distinct mechanisms of action and because they have distinct mechanisms of action, they're not cross resistant with one another and hopefully their toxicities don't overlap in a prohibitive way. Uh, now in a perfect world, if you can combine three such drugs, the probability of any one cell being resistant to all three is now 10 to the minus 18th. And now the math works for you uh, and you win. Uh, and, and we know uh, th this works because first of all, uh, this is what the, the treatment of, uh, uh, of tuberculosis looked like in the United States about hundred years ago until the advent of combination chemotherapy uh, for TB. Uh, it's certainly why we're now able to control or manage uh, HIV. And I would also argue, and we'll come back to this later, uh, when we do cure cancers like lymphomas and testicular cancers with uh, chemotherapy, again, we're using combinations. So I think increasingly people understand, you know, combinations have to be part of the future, but now I'm gonna uh, maybe surprise you a little bit. So uh, there are two kinds of combinations. I, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm usually a lumper, but now I'll be a splitter. So there are two kinds of combinations. So there's what I call rational combinations. Uh, people like rational combinations, uh, at least in the laboratory. So maybe you're gonna hit the same driver two different ways. Maybe we hit HIP2 with two different drugs. Uh, or maybe you at least hit the same pathway uh, two different ways. Uh, or maybe you exploit uh, gene-gene interactions like such as synthetic lethal or synthetic sick interactions. And so, for example, in the laboratory now, uh, what you could do is you could uh, treat cells with an active drug such as drug A, and then you could do a, a genome-wide CRISPR screen uh, looking for other targets that when inhibited uh, lead to even greater cell death or a greater compromise in cell fitness. So again, you're exploiting gene-gene uh, interactions when you do these sorts of uh, screens. Now, uh, this approach can certainly uh, work. So we know that sometimes hitting the right target really, really hard, uh, two or more ways is a good thing to do. So I think you know that in APML, uh, there's the PML-RAR fusion protein, 
uh, it's causative. Uh, so this is the causative fusion protein in acute promyocytic leukemia. Uh, and it's been discovered that if you can combine two drugs that hit this target two different ways, you can really uh, effectively cure uh, many of these patients. So again, we like rational combinations. Also, uh, I wasn't gonna show you a lot of data, but I will show you uh, briefly some data from uh, Nathan Chiroli because it does uh, dovetail with uh, some things David McDermott talked about uh, yesterday. So uh, Nathan was trying to understand uh, how belsudafen works in kidney cancer. Uh, so imagine HIF2 is driving the expression of multiple genes. For simplicity, I show four here. Now you come in with belsudafen, you downregulate all of these genes and the cells don't like it. Uh, but presumably some of these genes are more important uh, than others. And so uh, the idea was, what if we took uh, a version of CRISPR called CRISPR-A or CRISPR activation, where you can activate genes one at a time. And suppose we now systematically uh, turn on gene A or we turn on gene C, but we do this on a genome-wide fashion and ask which genes when reactivated artificially using CRISPR-A will overcome the anti-proliferative effects of, uh, of a belsudafan-like drug, at least in preclinical models. Uh, now, uh, for those of you keeping score, uh, we're leveraging technology developed by John Dench at the Broad Institute. And I realize uh, for many of you, this is probably irrelevant, but I just wanted to point out, so we're using a, a, a catalytically dead version of Cas9 that will not nick or cut the DNA, but it's now been joined to a transcriptional activation domain from BP64. Uh, and then the sgRNA is also engineered, so it recruits some additional uh, transactivator. So I apologize that this is so complicated and Baroque, but this turns out to be the particularly robust version of uh, CRISPR-A that John uh, had, had, had developed. So now we're ready to do uh, our screen. <clears throat> and so now what you're looking at are, is a volcano plot, and we're looking at the abundance of the CRISPR-A guides after 21 days of treatment with belsudafan. So anything on the right, these are genes that when activated uh, confer partial resistance to belsudafan. Uh, on the left are genes that when activated actually make belsudafan uh, work even better, which is uh, interesting in its own right, but we're not gonna talk about that today. Uh, but suffice it to say, if you now ask for HIF target genes on the right, uh, which uh, is the top score, and it turns out to be cyclin D1. Uh, cyclin D1, when reactivated, can largely in many of these cell lines overcome the, the proliferative disadvantage caused by uh, belsudafan. And we know, and you heard this uh, yesterday, that uh, cyclin D1, at least in kidney cancers, is regulated by HIF2 and upregulated uh, by uh, HIF2. Uh, so as uh, David mentioned to you yesterday, uh, we think this and many other lines of evidence point to the idea that maybe in kidney cancer, we really should be thinking about targeting both HIF2 uh, and cyclin D1. And David pointed out yesterday this uh, loose analogy, which I, don't, I think is fair, uh, that in breast cancer, we target the transcriptional regulator of cyclin D1, the estrogen receptor, and then we come in with the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And so maybe we should be doing the same thing in uh, kidney cancer. Now, uh, people like rational combinations because they're intellectually satisfying. We all like being puzzle solvers. We all like thinking we're reasonably smart. Uh, and so the pro is that they're intellectually satisfying, but the con is combining drugs against interdependent targets with shared biologies increases the risk for toxicity and increases the risk for uh, resistance. And so, for example, I think this audience knows we learned the hard way that hitting the VEGF pathway two different ways, at least with dirty drugs like sunitinib, is really difficult. And you finally get into the point where the endothelial cells say enough is enough, and you get microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and all sorts of other problems. Uh, but again, in terms of resistance, I've already told you the danger is if you, if you put all your eggs in one basket and you're going after one target, you increase the risk of uh, resistance. So I like the, the, the old saying, if you strike at the, kill, at the king, uh, you must kill him, because uh, otherwise you can be sure the cancer is uh, coming back. So that then brings me to empiric combinations. So empiric combinations, the con is it feels sort of un unintellectual. It feels like you're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall. Uh, but the pro is combining drugs and modalities with distinct mechanisms of action is actually the proven way uh, to enhance efficacy while minimizing toxicity and minimizing therapeutic uh, resistance. So imagine uh, three targets that I'm now imagining sort of biological space, and I have the three targets here. So when you're going for synergy, you frequently uh, have uh, targets that are maybe talking to each other, maybe they're pretty close to one another. Uh, 
uh, in biological space. Uh, maybe, for example, they function on the same uh, pathway. Uh, but when you're going for non-resistance, uh, and I think we've lost an animation, but now let's imagine these three targets and, and the clouds here are the potential resistance mechanisms. And again, we don't want those potential resistance mechanisms to overlap. And the way to make sure they don't overlap is to try to make sure your targets are actually pretty far away from one another in biological space. So again, you'd really like to be targeting very different biologies uh, all, all together. Uh, so, and I again remind you in this slide I showed you earlier, the, the operative word was we want three drugs that are not gonna be cross resistant with one another. And the best way to do that historically is to have drugs that have very distinct bi biologies. Uh, and there's some very nice work that's been done uh, by uh, Peter Sorger and uh, Adam uh, Palmer. Uh, Peter's at Harvard and I think Adam's now left to start his own laboratory. But they were looking at the activity of RCHOP in diffuse cystic cystic lymphoma and using a combination of genetic tools as well as mathematical modeling, they sort of re-derived that the secret sauce in RCHOP is almost certainly that the drugs in RCHOP are all non-cross resistant with one another. So I think that's where we probably wanna try to get uh, in the future. Uh, so, uh, so in getting to combinations, so just a few remaining uh, thoughts. Uh, first of all, some old fashioned uh, things are still gonna be important like uh, potency and specificity. And I'll also point out that the best drug for the eventual combination might not be the best drug as monotherapy, because as monotherapy, not only do you usually not get too penalized for off-target effects, sometimes you're rewarded for off-target effects. So I think sunitinib is active in part because it carries a lot of off-target effects in addition to VEGF inhibition. And so as monotherapy, maybe sunitinib or something like it would be your VEGF inhibitor uh, of, of choice. But I would argue if you were building a combination with a VEGF inhibitor, you wouldn't want sunitinib. I'm sorry for anyone I'm offending. Uh, but maybe you'd want even something as specific as Avastin because it's such, so, so much better tolerated because it's so much more uh, specific. Uh, I think we need to get out of the mindset of rotating single agents. Uh, I think we have to beware, beware of using drugs at the single agent MTD. I think if we want to build effective combinations, it's going to be difficult if every drug we're using at you know, sort of the brink of, of tolerability. And we might think, have to think more about you know, biologically effective doses rather than maximal tolerated doses. And I think we need to think creatively about clinical, clinical uh, trial design. And, and one reason for saying that, uh, again, is, uh, is simple math. So let, let's, uh, let's imagine we have to get to a four drug combination to cure uh, kidney cancer. Uh, so if we do this the old fashioned way, uh, then we need a lot of safety studies. We need uh, four safety trials for the single agents. And then we need six safety trials for all the possible doublets. And then we need four safety trials for the possible triplets. And then we finally need a safety trial for the quadruplet. So I won't live long enough to see this completed for any three or four drug combination in kidney cancer. So I think we have to get more comfortable in some cases, given the mechanisms of action and the tolerability of just sort of quickly getting through a pseudo safety evaluation. And in some cases, just combining the drugs. And when you think about it, I mean, I was an internist back in the eighties, you know, internists combine drugs all the time when they don't demand a phase one safety trial, every time they want to combine an antiarrhythmic with a cholesterol lowering drug uh, with, you know, antipsychotic, whatever it's going to be. So I think for some of our drugs, we should be able to get there. And I, and I think Merck and others are, are doing this uh, now. And so, uh, and, and so, and this, by the way, assumes no failures or missteps along the way, which will almost certainly not be uh, the case. Uh, so, you know, what's the old paradigm uh, in oncology, at least when I came here in the eighties. So you start, this is, Smith or Mr. Jones on drug A, they progress, you stop drug A, you start drug B, they progress, blah, 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 blah. And you know, it's hard to learn too many things there. And I kept, and of course, with each round of therapy, uh, the drugs typically get less and less effective, which brings up two points. One is I think increasingly with really good drugs, like for example, the HIP2 inhibitor, and by the way, I should declare I have a conflict of interest with at least one of the HIP2 inhibitors. You know, I think we have to think creatively, how do we get these drugs in the frontline uh, setting earlier? And I think here, the, the trial that was done in the VHL patients was very informative because that was effectively sort of a pseudo frontline uh, therapy. And you could see how much more active uh, belsudafan was in that uh, patient population. So I think the, the new paradigm we might want to at least think about if we're really trying to get to drugs that are not cross resistant with one another is you start drug A, you progress, you actually keep the patient on drug A, and then maybe you slowly do a within patient uh, escalation of drug B. 
And uh, one question would be, can you, can you achieve a biologically relevant dose of the B drug? Because uh, if you can't, it's, it's over. The drugs don't play nicely with one another. You probably can't combine them. But if, the, if, you, if you can get to a biologically relevant dose, for example, you have a pharmacodynamic assay and you can tell you're hitting uh, target B pretty well, then the question is, do you see any responses? If, if you don't rescue any of these patients, then presumably the two drugs are cross, largely cross-resistant with one another. But if you do salvage some of these patients and you do see responses, then it raises the possibility that in the future, uh, maybe we wanna use A plus B uh, and not A alone as sort of the initial uh, therapy. So uh, I'll thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know how I did on time, Tony, uh, but I think we can uh, take some questions if you would like. Thank you. <clears throat> ah, okay. Yeah. If to alpha. Um, first, do you believe all small molecule HIF to alpha inhibitors would work similarly? I mean, assuming absorption is not an issue there. Or do you think they're not created equals? That's the first question. The second, obviously, we know that drugs like HIF2 alpha inhibitors have uh, target and off target toxicities because they affect other cells in the body other than the tumor cells. Do you believe that genetic, uh, you spoke about genetic, do you think gene therapy, where we use, for example, sRNA to target the tumor cells only and sparing? the healthy tissues. Do you think that strategy, at least using hif to alpha knockdowns, do you think that will work? Well, so you've asked several interesting questions. I'm gonna answer them in a slightly different order as I remember them and try to answer them. So the first is, and again, I declare my financial conflict of interest that I acquired because I was an advisor to Peloton before it got acquired by Merck. Uh, you, you know, belsudafine is a remarkably specific uh, drug. So uh, first of all, I don't know that it has a lot of off-target effects in terms of other proteins that are being affected by the drug. I think there's very little evidence for that uh, either in the laboratory or in, in the clinic. Uh, I'm sure if you push the drug high enough, as is true for most drugs, we would start to engage other targets. But there, there's certainly a window where it seems to be remarkably specific. And to my knowledge, most, if not all of the clinical side effects are on target, whether it's anemia from suppressing erythropoietin, whether it's hypoxia from affecting uh, pulmonary endothelial cells, as well as the carotid body where HIP2 plays important roles. Uh, but I'm not aware of any good evidence that there's some off-target baggage that belsudafan is carrying. But you also raise the issue of, okay, let's just stay with HIP2 for the moment. You know, what about on target? toxicities in other tissues. I just mentioned a couple, anemia and maybe uh, hypoxemia. Uh, so you know, I think one thing that again works for us is HIF-1, the more famous HIF, is ubiquitously expressed. Every cell of the body makes HIF-1. There are actually very few cells in the body that express HIF-2. So that actually works in our favor. Now it does turn out, as I said, the carotid body expresses HIF-2 and some pulmonary vascular cells express uh, HIF-2. So there are some normal tissues. So maybe, maybe, maybe someone will break the back of the sRNA delivery problem or some other cute delivery method that really allows us to target specifically the tumor and nothing else. But I don't see that on the immediate horizon. Uh, I, you know, and I think sRNA delivery still has some, uh, some challenges and I don't know that we're anywhere close to saying we're gonna get it specifically to the tumor cells. So I can imagine ways you could enhance delivery uh, to the tumor cells. Uh, but I guess, the, you know, the final point is, again, getting back to, you know, if you, if you have exactly the right target, could you make a case for combining uh, sRNA with, uh, with an allosteric inhibitor? I think the answer is yes, but you are violating one of my rules about cross-resistance. But at least if this is, you know, if that's the king, let's, we could try to kill the king by, do, by doing that. So I think, I think hopefully I answered at least half of your questions. Uh, did, yeah. I miss, did I miss a big one? Yes, but the other question, do you think all of the Work that's a good question. Yeah, that's really that's really hard. So I don't I don't know of any laboratory experiment that would start to allow me to pick the winners amongst the HIF2 inhibitors. I think again, old-fashioned things like potency, specificity, bioavailability will all, all matter, but I, I can't pick a winner there yet. I, I just think Bolsudavan, again, with my conflict declared, is a pretty damn good, <clears throat> damn good drug. 
Uh, so someone will have to come along and make a compelling case. And then, and then the other thing is, you know, sometimes you can clearly become best in class and at a fast follower where, for example, you dial out someone else's off target activity. But again, I'm not sure about Sudafan is carrying that much off target activity. So the only play then would be better potency and better bioavailability. But again, I'm not sure there's that much more room uh, to play there. So again, I, I, I want to be fair. I, I can't pick a winner here, but I think that the bar is probably pretty high with, with Bill Sudafan. Bill, quick yeah. question. Yeah. Just one this is great it works for chemotherapy drugs that can you know target you know cancer cells but what about i mean forget about vegetative inhibitor immunotherapy that work different you put it in the same bucket when you talk about combination yeah well so, so again i think immunotherapy is a great example of really coming in now with a very different type of attack on the tumor so again the principles of combination chemotherapy would suggest wouldn't it be great if one of those arms was really quite orthogonal to the direct attack on the tumor cell itself such as for example by engaging the immune system yeah now chin chin uh, uh, jiang from my lab is going to talk uh, later this afternoon and she's going to give you some reasons to uh, begin to appreciate that there could def definitely be interactions between a hip inhibitor and an immune checkpoint inhibitor that we didn't anticipate even a year ago. But I'm not yet at the point where I'm willing to say whether the net effect would be positive or negative. It's simply I, when there's one more level of interaction we didn't appreciate before. But you know the benefits of combinations are so profound that only kicking and screaming would you tell me, or would you convince me we shouldn't try a HIF2 inhibitor with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, despite the very intriguing data that uh, Chin Chin's gonna share with you this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, so a, a couple of quick questions. Hey, Bill. Oh. Um, so I, I guess two questions following up on the idea of combination. So one is the follow up on Tony's, which is there's an assumption that for the math to work that everything's independent, but often with immune therapy, things are interacting. And so how do you model that in the lab, uh, that level of complexity? And the second part would be if you're going to bore sort of from the chemotherapy analogy for pediatric chemotherapies. Yeah. yeah. Often drugs are too toxic to give at once, right? You look at pediatric leukemias, you give induction chemotherapy separately, you then you give consolidation. There's sort of a pattern to do that that enables you to get many, many drugs in. So how do you think about modeling that for something like kidney cancer, both in the lab or in terms of clinical trial design? Yeah, well, this is gonna be painful for me to say because I, I partly make a living doing preclinical models in mice, but uh, let's all agree there are profound limitations to all the available preclinical models. You know, there's the old saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, I, you know, I think there are some, for some questions, I think we can accept the inadequacies of our current preclinical models. Uh, but when you start to some of these very nuanced questions like combination therapies, especially when they involve immunotherapy, where as you know, there are particular challenges going back and forth between man and mouse. So uh, that's why uh, I'm, I'm for more creatively using the clinic to ask some questions earlier rather than later, rather than kidding ourselves that a decade of mice work will give us the definitive answer. I just don't think that's gonna be the case. So uh, you know, I think we wanna use the mouse for what it can tell us, try to establish some paradigms, try to learn a little bit of biology, but I think we should get into the clinic earlier rather than later. I'm sorry for doing this, but I'm kind of blinded by the light. So, mm -hmm. as I, uh, so where, where, where do we go next? Okay, are we over here? I'm going to try to put some poke some see, holes into yeah. what you're saying. And I was an intern in the very early 80s. And if you remember back then, there was a drive in lymphoma and in breast cancer, cancer to throw every drug together and with the exact rationale you had. And actually, from all those chemotherapy studies, the answer was that wasn't correct, that if you gave CAF, uh, it was not better, in fact, less good as C than A than F. And if you gave CHOP, it was just as good as MACOP B and, you know, five other regimens. And it, it seemed like it really proved that this concept that you hit you kill a certain number of cells, you get them to a size, you kill them. And I actually really have questioned that. Now, maybe immunology 
uh, throws that and maybe targeted therapy also um, has nothing to do with it because of chemotherapy. But I really question how you can put all of these together, not get severe toxicity, as opposed to maybe do it sequentially. And that's not way to okay. progression, but it's in sequence. So Jeff, I, uh, this might be the first time we've publicly disagreed in about 25 years, but I'm going to vehemently disagree with you. First well, of all, that's fine. I, I, cause I, you know, we're contemporaries. We also lived through those painful days. The, the, the CAFs versus PVBs or, or that's, forget that, you know, we, we, we were using very crude drugs with, with little or no genetic validation with little or no biological insights uh, into why they would be useful in those diseases and where the therapeutic index was like 1.05, you know? So, I mean, these were really toxic drugs. Uh, on the flip side, I, I think the fact that our chop to the first approximation is as good as may cop be almost proves my point because I think they're both examples of combining multiple drugs that are individually active in lymphoma, but I don't think you treat a lymphoma patient with a, with single agent methotrexate or, or cytoxan. I think, I think it's, we got, a, we got terribly lucky there. And I still don't think we understand our luck, wh why uh, certain cytotoxic drugs work particularly well in lymphoma. And despite their terrible therapeutic indices, we were able to combine them with relative uh, impunity. So I, I'm hopeful that as the future is more drugs like Velsudafan and other drugs that are much better tolerated, we can at least re-explore this. I th where I thought you were going to go is you and I, as uh, young doctors in the 80s, watched AIDS start to take over uh, many hospitals, at okay. least in the inner cities. Yeah. And when AZT came along, that was great. But people didn't say, let's spend the next 20 years figuring out all the ways you can become resistant right. to single agent AZT. They said, we need a drug with a distinct mechanism of action that we can combine with AZT, and then we'll manage uh, HIV, which is what happened. So I'm not sure the analogy is completely fair. No, you're right. Going back to adriamycin and cytoxin. But the, but the concept, you're right. I, I agree with you on all that. But the concept was that you kill a certain number and then you add another drug, you kill a certain yeah. number. And I think that's really flawed. But that, I think that's a whole different question than you're looking what? at, which I think is, is much what? more... I, I know I'm mindful of time, but okay. for example, you know, Jim Brooke Wallace has already shown that at least in some patients who become resistant to Belsudafan. Yeah, thank you. And now it can be, uh, <laughs> is this the Blues Brothers? That can be the Blues Brothers. Uh, I don't know if I'm John Belushi or Dan Aykroyd. Uh, but, oh yeah. You know, at, at least in some of those, there's a mutation in HIF2 that renders HIF2 uh, resistant to the drug. So that's very powerful. First of all, it tells you the killing was on target. But that's just an example of, gee, imagine you had had a second drug that wasn't dependent on at least that drug binding pocket in HIF2, or maybe it wasn't even dependent on HIF2 at all. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll defer to you in terms of- uh, oh, oh, it's about the time. Uh, I, I meant more about the time. I, if you want to disagree with me, that's another story, but uh, uh, Kim. Yeah, uh, uh, good segue. And, and they had just flashed up the graph that, that you used um, throughout your talk about um, genetic validation and, and biological understanding. And so it, it, um, it surprises me that your paradigm doesn't include some genetic testing of the patient because beyond, beyond VHL mutation, there's a lot of heterogeneity that comes in and we have technology to really, to really understand the genetics of an individual patient. Um, so you want to know the germline mutations or ger germline status of various genes as predictors? Oh, yeah, or somatic mutation is more what I'm thinking, but, but, uh, but understanding the, the genetic repertoire of each patient's tumor. As oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I thought that was implicit and it's only a 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I assumed. Good. Thank you. for. So if it wasn't, you know, I think we do have not only VHL, but PBRM, PBRM1 and BAP1 and other mutations that might eventually be guideposts. So thank you for pointing out. I should have had a slide uh, for, to that. But you're, abs you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm assuming we're going to be guided by the mutations in the actual tumor. Yeah. Good. To the CRISPR screen, yeah. So I think so. I, I know the question was sufficiency yeah. of downstream genes as potential mechanism of resistance, but I think the beauty of the screen is that you would pick up redundancy in the system as well just by doing it at the scale at which it was done. And if you actually see many of the genes that you're scoring, 
uh, our transcription factors, your scoring HNF and the PACs and linear specific transcription factors. Uh, other RTKs are scoring in the screen as well, EFNA, et cetera. So in, in, are you thinking in terms of suppressing HIF, but now providing an alternative exit ramp for the- Well, well two things in this year. Uh, so, so one, again, in a 20 minute talk, I didn't show the data in the DMSO treated cells as the control. But for example, in the DMSO treated cells, you can see that one of the genes on the far right is uh, MYC, which goes along with work from a number of laboratories. I think Kim, you're one of them that shows that MYC uh, promotes the growth of kidney cancer cells, but that's irrespective of treatment. Right. Uh, I think where I think you're going, which is to now try to engineer a clever combination gets back to rational combinations. And so I think you could do that and maybe that's the right thing to do, but I do worry about the whack-a-mole uh, problem and so again you would I, combine right you would well, up, up front you would combine the two hits based it, on your model yeah, yeah. but i think i think you're i think it, it's revealing that the same classical downstream program that we associate with hif are independently scoring in the hif resistant alone okay. even when you're suppressing okay. so Let, let's talk about that a little bit offline i think one more final and, and the, <laughs> no that's it okay Talk, I, I, you know, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more specifically on your expectations for combining VEGF inhibition with HIF2 inhibition, you know, yeah. um, so we've seen data from Tony and colleagues yeah. for cabozantinib mm -hmm. with belzutifan. Laurence had some nice data at ASCO this year for Len with belzutifan. Um, my interpretation is it's a little bit all over the place right now. I don't really know, you know, if there's true clinical synergy there. What are your right. expectations? Well, as, I, as this audience knows well, I think combining a VEGF inhibitor with a VEGFR inhibitor proved to be pretty toxic. Uh, however, I am cautiously optimistic about combining a, a clean VEGF inhibitor with a HIF2 inhibitor, despite the fact that it does violate one of my rules. You are now hitting one of the same pathways, but I think it's, we know it's a really important pathway. Uh, I, you know, I, I like to point out to people that not all the VEGF in a kidney cancer is coming from the kidney cancer cells right, because you have a hypoxic tumor. So actually the host stroma is also producing some of the VEGF. So if we think VEGF is important in kidney cancer, and I think we all think it's important, uh, and you wanted to mop up that remaining VEGF that's being produced by the host cells and not the tumor cells, it would make sense to me to combine a, a relatively clean VEGF inhibitor with belsudafan. And again, belsudafan just illustrates uh, that if you have a clean enough drug that's well tolerated, you can do some interesting biology and maybe even interesting Therapeutic. So I think it makes some sense, but again, you're really hitting the VEGF uh, pathway. But the nice thing is, again, HIF2 is, as I just said earlier, not in most normal tissues. And so I don't think we're going to get into the, quite the same problem we did combining the sinitinibs of the world with Avastin. Perfect. I mean, this, this was 